Hello, welcome my friends and colleagues in new video of our YouTube channel. Number 1 Doctor, today we'll have a lecture. Hope you enjoy, get benefits. But before we start the lecture, do not forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel Number 1 Doctor. Like the video, share the video on social media. Follow us on our social accounts below the description. If you have any ideas, leave it in comments below the video. Okay doctor, can we start the lecture now? Okay, we will start soon. Good morning my dear friends. Our topic for presentation today is X-rays in surgery, especially in general surgery. So what is the importance of X-rays? It is a very much accessible imaging tool as far as a clinician is concerned. In most of the other imaging tools, the radiologist reads the report. It is not like that in X-rays. In almost all cases of X-rays, the clinician itself reads the X-ray and many a times the clinician is better than radiologist in reading an X-ray. Whereas in CT, ultrasound, MRI, etc., always the radiologist makes the gives the final report. That makes X-rays unique. So, we should know how to read an X-ray and make and to make a diagnosis or a provisional diagnosis out of it correlating with the clinical findings. The application of reading X-rays in general surgery. This is what we are going to discuss today. The objective of our presentation today is to acquaint the medical student with the X-rays that we usually see in general surgery so that he will be able to interpret those X-rays. From an MBBS exam point of view, these are the X-rays which are generally kept for the exam. Now, in brief, we will discuss about abdominal X-ray. The abdominal X-ray is one of the most common X-rays which we see in general surgery because acute abdomen was comes very common in a surgery casualty. Then we will go into chest x-ray which is very much important in case of trauma. And x-ray neck which has utility in thyroid cases in trauma. But in our presentation we will generally more and more ourselves into the x-ray neck in case of trauma. These are again I, I say that these are the x-rays which are generally seen more by the clinician and not by the radiologist. Make it addictive that you take abdominal x-ray in all patients with acute abdomen. But, but always ask regarding LMP in a patient with a fem in a female reproductive age group. In case she is pregnant, we should not want, we do not want to give a damage to the fetus. So we should always avoid a damage to fetus. So in a female in reproductive age group, caution before taking, there should be caution before taking an abdominal x-ray erect. Now coming to the views of abdominal x-ray erect. The abdominal x-ray erect view is the most common view we generally take because we want, we, we will get see important findings which we will go discuss in the further slide. This is the erect view. Now coming to the supine view which is the next common view we will take. Supine view will more than making a diagnosis. It will help us to add on to the findings that it will help us to give more information or add on information to the findings that we see in the abdominal x-ray erect. Sometimes the patient may be and he will be unable to stay erect, especially debilitated people. In that case, abdominal x-ray left lateral decubitus view helps to give some amount of the idea which the abdominal x-ray erect view gives. We will discuss each one of these views in detail. So, first of all, we will discuss abdominal x-ray erect. This is the abdominal x-ray erect view. Initially, when we see an abdominal x-ray erect, we have a lot of doubts. Like, is the granularity we see here important? Or is this air shadow important? These are the initial confusions when we see an abdominal x-ray erect. But before looking into all those, 
always check the name, age, confirm the view, look for the and go in an orderly manner. Look for the bony skeleton initially, then look for the soft tissue shadows and finally the air shadows. It is sometimes very easy to say this, but all, most of the times our eye goes into the pathology or the diagnosis of the case. So what to do then? In the initial, it is virtually impossible not to look into the pathology and go in for the orderly methodical view. So go for the primary survey and make a professional diagnosis. Let it be air under diaphragm or air fluid levels, anything. But say then go in for the secondary survey where you will go methodically from the bony shadow to the soft tissue shadow to the air shadow. And that, that means you go from more white to lesser white and finally into the black. So that we will be able, we will not miss any important findings. Now, in an x-ray we will see a lot of things we have already said. But what are we bothered about? We are only bothered about the findings these are which are free air under diaphragm and air fluid levels. What is the importance of these findings? These are the findings if we miss the patient is going to die. Free air under diaphragm means perforation peritonitis. Air fluid levels means intestinal obstruction. So if we are going to miss free air under diaphragm and air fluid levels, the patient is going to die or, or we will make the diagnosis later and the chance of mortality is going to be very high. So, we will come into, this is a case of an air under diaphragm. How will we detect air under diaphragm? In an x-ray, the air is seen as black, we say. We can see the diaphragm, we can see the both domes of the diaphragm here. This is the right dome of the diaphragm and this is the left dome of the diaphragm. So, we see air on both these sides, on the right side, on the left side. Which air are we going to believe? You see the air floats up. When the patient stands erect, the air floats up above, above the liver and above the stomach. And above the, above the liver and above the stomach. On the right side, we have the liver. And on the left side, we have the stomach. So, the problem on the left side, if we look for air under diaphragm on the left side is, we have both the fundic air shadow and the air under diaphragm on the left side. So, what happens? There is a confusion that whether it is a fundic air shadow or an air under diaphragm. Air under diaphragm is also called pneumoperitoneum. So, when you look for air under diaphragm, always look on the right side, above the liver, below the diaphragm. So, I again repeat, when you look for air under diaphragm, always look on the right side, above the liver, below the diaphragm. And a very interesting fact I would like you to notice here right, that even so, even, uh, even though I started as abdominal x-ray erect, what we are actually looking is the chest x-ray, chest x-ray PA view, erect view. So what is this? What is our inference? Even, even a, a chest x-ray can also be very helpful while taking and while in detecting an abdominal x-ray and in detecting a pneumoperitoneum. Now, this is another case of air under diaphragm. When we see an air under diaphragm in a patient, it means that there is a hollow viscous perforation. It can be a gastric perforation or a duodenal perforation and sometimes a sigmoid diverticular perforation or an appendicular perforation can also present as air under diaphragm. What does it mean? It means that it is a surgical emergency. The sun should not set and rise. The sun should not set and rise on a perforation. We should do a laparotomy and repair the perforation before that or else there is a high chance of mortality for the patient. Now, this is another case of air under diaphragm. The air under diaphragm may not be always very typical. This is a mass case of massive pneumoperitoneum following a trauma. You can see the chest tube here. Okay. And you can also see a subcutaneous emphysema here. 
Subcutaneous emphysema is also palpable on, on examination when we palpate the chest or abdomen. If you see a subcutaneous emphysema, you see a subcutaneous, this may be most in, in this case, it may be due to a diaphragmatic injury and the, lung, and the air from the lung might have escaped to the abdomen, most probably. So, when you palpate and when you see a diaphragm, when you see an subcutaneous emphysema or subcutaneous crackling, you should understand that there is an injury in the tracheobronchial pathway or an injury to the alveoli and that is there is an amount of pneumothorax. So, I say I again repeat that air under diaphragm may not be always subtle. It can also be like this in a dramatic manner. Now, what is here? What is this, this white arrow signify? Yes, it is also a case of pneumoperitoneum. What do you see here? You can see that you are not seeing it above the liver. You are seeing it on the towards the right side of the liver. Why? Because it is a left lateral decubitus view. This is the same x-ray as the previous slide. You can see the air floats above the liver. So, we are seeing the air under the air. Instead of seeing on the above the liver, we are seeing it more towards the right side of the liver as the air floats and this is the due to because it is the left lateral decubitus view. So, this is the importance of the left lateral decubitus view. Sometimes the patient in peritonitis may be unable to stand up with the hollow viscous perforation and the peritonitis will be unable to stand up. In those cases, the left lateral decubitus view helps to detect the air under diaphragm. Now, you see this x-ray. On the left side, we have a normal abdominal x-ray, right? And on the right side, we are seeing the air multiple air fluid levels. So, does the, how when will we see air fluid levels? Do we see air fluid levels always in a normal x-ray or is it only in pathology? Or why are we not seeing this much air fluid levels in a normal abdominal x-ray right? So, I am taking this bottle. You see this bottle. Okay. You see this bottle. There is fluid and there is air and you are seeing an air fluid level. Suppose I shake this bottle. Okay. Suppose I shake this bottle. Are you seeing an air fluid level? You won't. Because there will be no air fluid level when the bottle is in the in movement. Exactly the same thing happens in the abdomen. When there is peristalsis, the air and the fluid is being mixed and we are not going to see an air fluid level. But in case of intestinal obstruction, there is, will be some amount of, there will be stasis. So, when there is stasis, what will happen? The bowel will go into ileus and there will be an air fluid level. So, wherever there is stasis, we can see an air fluid level. Please note that ileus, when, when I said that the bowel will go to ileus means, the ileus has nothing to do with, ileus has nothing to do with uh, ileum. ileus. Many a times when I say, when we see here paralytic ileus first, uh, our doubt is whether it is, uh, is something to do with ileum. No, ileus has nothing to do with ileum. It means that it is a lack of, there is a lack of peristalsis in the bowel. So, whenever there is stasis in the abdomen, stasis in the bowel, there is air fluid levels. So, is there, a, is there areas where there are stasis in case of a normal abdomen or a normal, or do we see air fluid levels in normal abdominal x-ray, right? Yes. Where are they? They are at the points of sphincters, on the ileocecal junction, near the pylorus. We may see an air fluid levels. So, when we see two air fluid levels, it may not be a pathology. It can be near the pylorus and it can be near the ileocecal junction. But when we see more than two, when we see three or more air fluid levels, we will say there is a multiple air fluid levels. So, more the number of air fluid levels, the more the chance for intestinal obstruction is. Arbitrarily, we can say that there are, there is a, there are six air fluid levels, there is intestinal obstruction, but it is not a perfect dictum. 
when we are seeing when there is when there are more than when there is three or more air fluid levels there is there is multiple air fluid levels and there is a chance for intestinal obstruction now that we have identified how to visualize a pneumoperitoneum and we have understood the importance of it as perforation peritonitis and to identify the multiple air fluid levels in the abdominal x-ray rect, x rect and to understand that it is suggestive of intestinal obstruction. Now we will try to read the multiple uh, shadows, multiple black shadows we see in the abdominal x-ray rect. Gastrointestinal tract in abdominal x-ray rect. In this following presentation, we will use in the following part of the presentation, we will use both the supine x-rays and the erect x-rays to identify the gastrointestinal tract. First, see this x-ray. This is an x-ray of the which part, which part of the bowel, what, which bowel, which part bowel will be this much big, this much large and showing this shape, yes, you can see the, yes, this is the greater curvature, no doubt about it, this is the greater curvature and this is the lesser curvature, the antrum of the stomach, yes, this is the stomach we see in an abdominal x-ray, supine view, okay, supine view showing the dilated stomach. This is the erect view. We see the large air fluid level of the stomach. This is the erect abdominal x-ray erect view where which this in this case the obstruction must be must be at the range of pylorus. We see a multiple, we are seeing a single large air fluid level suggestive of the gastric outlet obstruction in this case. This is the spine view and this is the erect view. What is this case? This is a case of multiple air fluid levels. We will see air fluid le levels when we take an erect x-ray. Okay. Now this is another x-ray showing multiple air fluid levels in an erect view. Now this is the x-ray of the above patient in the supine position. Can you see the difference? There is no air fluid levels in the supine view. There are no, this is the x-ray, the x-ray, erect x-ray showing the multiple air fluid levels. And in, in the supine x-ray, there are no air fluid levels. Why is it like that? Yeah. This is the erect view. You are seeing here the fish in the bowl. Okay. This is the erect view you are seeing here and this is the supine view you are seeing downstairs. In the erect view you can see the air fluid levels but in supine view we will not see any air fluid levels. This is the same thing that is happening in an abdominal x-ray erect. In erect view, abdominal x-ray, in erect view air fluid level, in supine view there is no air fluid levels. Then what is the, why do we want the supine x-ray? What is the use of the supine x-ray? See, now this is the supine view of the abdomen, abdomen and we have, we have seen earlier. What the, the, the earlier x-ray is this where we, had, we are seeing the multiple air fluid levels and this is the supine view. Of course, you will not see a multi, see multiple air fluid levels in the supine view. You will see a multiple air fluid levels in the erect view. But what is more, what do, then what do you see in the supine view? Yes. In the supine view, the fluid in the bowel floats down and the air in the bowel floats up, floats up. So what happens? You will see a better delineation of the bowel. So to understand the bowel better, to understand the involved bowel better, to understand which bowel loop is dilated, supine view is much better than an erect view. For the diagnosis of an intestinal obstruction, erect view is better. But to understand which bowel is involved, supine view is better. So it will help us to give, it will give us an idea into the level of obstruction, which level it is obstructed. Now, what are we seeing in this x-ray? We are seeing the 
valvule condimentus. What is this is the valvule condimentus. What is what is what is meant by valvule condimentus? If we see valvule condimentus, what does it mean? The involved bowel is the jejunum. Suppose we cut open the jejunum, if we see the mucosal pattern in the jejunum like this in a spiral mode. The circles will be in the circles will be complete. There will be spiral, spiral, spiral like that. So when we cut open the jejunum, the mucosal pattern is like this. So in X-ray, we will see the valvulae condimentus. Now, what about ileum? This is a picture of ileum. What is the importance in ileum? In an X-ray, the ileum is featureless. There is no characteristic feature of our ileum in X-ray. So, where is the level of obstruction in this case? How can we identify the level of obstruction in this case? In this case, we can say the obstruction is in the distal ileum. The colon is not dilated. The ileum is dilated. The obstruction will be in the distal ileum. So, we can identify the level of obstruction from a supine X-ray provided there is an a multiplier or multiplier fluid levels in the electric X-ray. Featureless. Now, we already know that this is the jejunum and we are seeing the valvule condimented with a violet arrow. Now, do you see any other bowel in this? Yes, you can also see the featureless ileum here. Yes, this is the featureless ileum. So, how do we know where the where is the level of obstruction? The level of obstruction will be in the ileum. The jejunum is dilated, the ileum is dilated, the colon is not dilated. The level of obstruction will be in the, most probably in the ileum. Thus, we can again identify, we can identify different types of bowel, jejunum and ileum in the abdominal x-ray supine view. So, now we know to identify the stomach, the jejunum and the ileum in a supine x-ray, in an x-ray abdomen. Okay. Now, this is another x-ray we generally come across. Sometimes we see a loop in the x-ray like this. So, is these loops, is these dilated loops significant? That is the first question we comes to, is come to our mind. Is this loop, is there a paralytic ileus in this loop? Is the loop dilated? In case of abdominal inflammation, inflamed, inflamed inflammation in the peritoneum, suppose say acute appendicitis or acute pancreatitis, a loop may be dilated which is adjacent to The loop which is touching onto the inflammation may go in for a paralytic ileus and it may be dilated. How do we know whether it is a dilated loop or not? As an arbitrary rule, if it is a small bowel, a more than 3 cm diameter is suggestive of dilatation. And if it is large bowel, a more than 6 cm, dia 6 cm diameter is considered as a dilation. But this is an arbitrary rule. After some time, we will look into the sub, we will see the bowel we, after some practice. The subjective assessment becomes more important than the objective assessment in case of centimeters. So, what is the bowel involved in this picture? It is the jejunum. You can see, you are seeing the valvulae condimentus here. Right? This, you are seeing the valvulae condimentus here. So, the involved bowel is the jejunum. Now, why the jejunum is involved? In this case, it can be due to an acute appendicitis and the jejunum will be dilated. And these types of loop, which is in relation, which is in close opposition to an inflammation, is called a sentinel loop. In appendicitis, you can get a sentinel loop. In acute pancreatitis, you can get a sentinel loop. So, whenever there is inflammation close to it, there can be, there will be a dilated loop. There will be a loop which has gone into ileus, which is called a sentinel loop. Why is it called sentinel loop? Sentinel? Yes. In olden times, this is the person. This is a person. Th these people will be generally in a more relaxed mode and this person will be sitting in upside over the tree and he will be looking in 
who where is where the enemy is when the enemy comes he will be the person to see the enemy first and he will alarm the others exactly like this whenever there is an inflammation abdomen the loop nearby it go into paralytic ileus and it sounds the other part it sounds to us that there is an inflammation there is a war coming this is called a sentinel loop and exactly whenever there whenever there is an inflammation a loop near it can be inflamed which is called a sentinel loop Now, we have identified the jejunum and ileum. Next bowel we have to identify is the colon. How will we identify the colon? Colon is generally located towards the periphery. The jejunum and ileum is generally towards the center of abdomen. Even clinically this difference we can see. In case of a small intestinal obstruction, the distension will be in the central part of the abdomen. In case of a large intestinal obstruction, the distension will be in the peripheral part of the tissue. This is because the colon is located more towards periphery. So, one of the identification features of the colon is it is located more towards the periphery of the abdomen. Next, hostrations. These are the hostrations we see in the colon. We are seeing the hostrations here in the colon. How will we do the difference between the hostrations and valvular condimentus? Hostrations. This is a colonoscopic view. Okay. This is the colonoscopic view. We will see that the hostrations are not complete circles. They are generally incomplete circles. Exactly like that. In valvular condimentus, we had seen the complete circle. We are here the hostrations we see as incomplete circle. Another thing, so we have a doubt whether there is obstruction in this case. Suppose this is a normal X ray or not. We have a doubt. How will we understand that? For that, for the to be obstruction, there will be a certain cutoff of the gas in the colon. We can see that there is no sudden cutoff like that. And we are seeing this is the rectal gas. This is also very important. Suppose we are seeing rectal gas, we can be sure that until that point there is no obstruction. So there, there is no sudden cutoff of the air in the colon and there is rectal gas, we can very well say that there is no obstruction until the level of rectum. Now, this is another case. What is this? This is a case of large bowel obstruction. How will we say that this is a large bowel obstruction? We are seeing a dilated bowel here once dilated large bowel here more than 6 cm diameter ok now this was this is our earlier x-ray ok here we are not seeing here the, the, we can very well see that the large bowel is dilated next thing we will see that the host trends there are multiple air fluid levels there are multiple air fluid levels suggestive of large bowel obstruction the third thing which comes to our help is it that there are hostrations. The hostrations in the large bowel, in this case, unlike in the earlier normal X-ray, are effaced. The effacement of hostration is another feature of large bowel obstruction. And the fourth feature that comes to our help is, there is no colon cutoff sign. The colon, we can see that the bowel in the gas in the large bowel is suddenly cut off at the level of sigmoid colon here. Sigmoid or the lower descending colon. So, in this case, there is no cutoff. The colon cutoff, the sudden cutoff of the colonic air is another feature of obstruction. And the next feature that helps to identify the large bowel obstruction is the presence of absence of rectal gas in this case. You can see a rectal gas in the normal abdominal x-ray, but we are seeing no rectal gas in this case. This is another feature that will help us to identify whether there is large bowel obstruction or not. So, this is a case of large bowel obstruction showing the effacement of the hostrations, dilatation of the large bowel, multiplayer fluid levels, sudden cutoff of the colonic gas and the absence of rectal gas. Now we have seen the large bowel obstruction and how will we identify the large bowel obstruction. But what about the sigmoid colon? In sigmoid colon, unlike the ascending, descending and transverse colon, the hostrations 
are not very clearly seen. The hostations become less pronounced. So, how will we know whether the sigmoid colon is dilated? This is the classical picture of sigmoid volvulus, one of the most common cause of sigmoid colon obstruction. Showing what appearance? Yes, this is called the coffee bean appearance, which is seen in the sigmoid colon. Exactly, this in the coffee bean shape. So, keep this picture in mind. Sigmoid volvulus coffee bean appearance. Now, this is one of the most common x-rays. What is the most common x-rays we see? You see that dark circle, the black circle. What do you see? That granular thing. This may be the most common finding we see in the x-ray. But they are the fecal matter. Don't think it is a pathology. It is the fecal matter we are seeing in the x-rays. Now, these are the basic, what we have seen that the, they are the basic guidelines of seeing an abdominal x-ray. In your clinical practice, while you learn, you will come across a one, one many a lot of wonderful x-rays as far as uh, wonderful abdominal x-rays. When you see those x-rays, apply the basic principle, the bony skeleton, the air, the soft tissue, the erect view, the multiple air fluid levels, the supine view, the different types of bowel, the stomach, ileum, valvule, condimentus, everything. You apply all these into it, you will be able to identify the pathology and you will be able to reach a diagnosis in most of the cases. But always clinically correlate. Now, since we have finished off the abdominal x-ray, we will come to the chest x-ray. Many a times, the problem with the surgeons is in many of the elective cases, we will just make a glance at the chest x-ray and we will leave it to the anesthetist. In preoperative checkup, anyway, they will check it. So, what is the big deal? So, most of the times, we may just sideline the chest x-ray. But when it comes to trauma case, when it comes to the surgery casualty, chest x-ray is very important. We have to, it becomes a point of saving and losing a life. To correct, when we, if you are able to correctly read a chest x-ray, we can many a times save lives. In case of pneumothorax, in case of chemothorax, we will come to it. So, this is how a chest x-ray is taken. It is generally a PA, PA view. But in many trauma cases, if the patient can't be mobilized, suppose a case like this comes, we will have to adjust with the AP view. Okay. So, this is the classical chest x-ray PA view. Now, when we see an x-ray like this, how will our eye go about it? Obviously, I have said earlier that we have a tendency to go into the pathology first. It is okay. But after the primary survey, go in for the secondary survey. So, how will your eye go into it? First, look in for the, after the primary survey, when we go in for the methodical survey, look in for the bony skeleton. First, we look at the clavicle, the scapula, then e go for the each rib, the first rib, the second rib, the third, second rib, the third rib, go in a methodical manner on each of the ribs. Go from the right side to the, like this, like this, like this, then to the, and start to the, on the left side also, you see each ribs in the same way. This will help us to identify the, any defects in the bony skeleton. If there is a scap clavicle fracture, scapula fractures, rib fractures, etc., you should identify. After the, after the bony skeleton, you go in for the media stain. Look at the media stain. You can see the trachea here first. You go in for, you look at the media stain like this. You see the trachea here and then you see the cardiac shadows in the media stain. So, in the media stain, you should go in this fashion. You will see the different parts of the media stain. 
after this once we see the how will we know the uh, how will we know the different parts of the cardiac shadow we have to know the different parts of the cardiac shadow this is the aortic knuckle the pulmonary trunk which is more we will see it as a concavity rather than the convexity the left auricle and the left ventricle we will see the superior vena cava right atrium and the inferior vena cava on the right side and the inferior border of the cardiac shadow is mainly formed by the right ventricle now after we have seen the mediastinum now we should go in for the air spaces you see the lung, lung like this. You start from this side. You go like this, go like this. You see the black part of it. Now you are concentrating on the black part of the air shadow now, not on the white ribs. They are concentrating. We look for the cardiophrenic angle here. We look for the costophrenic angle here. Now coming here, you again look at this cardiophrenic angle, this costophrenic angle. During this period, you have to see the domes of the diaphragm. Then go like this, go like this, go like this towards the opposite side, concentrating on the air all the way, all these times, concentrate on the air shadow of it. Now at last, you see the subcutaneous spaces, the soft tissue shadow for the release to see whether there is any emphysema or subcutaneous emphysema or surgical emphysema. Now, one of our professors once asked us, what is the x-ray? Is this x-ray a male patient or a female patient? It is an x-ray of the female patient. This part is not a lung margin. It is a breast shadow. So, always you should know to identify a breast shadow. Don't, uh, don't mistake for lung margin. You can see the markings of the lung here beyond the margin of the breast. Now, Identify the chest expert. This is a case of right pneumothorax. When we say it is a right pneumothorax, it is easy to diagnose. But how will we say whether there is a how which are the diagnostic points which will help us to identify that it is a pneumothorax? One, you have to identify the length margin. This is the length margin here. You have to identify the length margin. This is the length margin here. Next, second case, the absence of the parenchymal mark. These are the parenchymal markings. The absence of the parenchymal, mark, parenchymal markings outside the lung margin. There are no parenchymal markings here. Here you can see the parenchymal markings. And finally, not in all of the cases, but in some cases, there will be a mediastinal shift. Identifying the pneumothorax is very important and the action has to be taken immediately because it will be life-saving. Now, this is another case of pneumothorax, right pneumothorax, again you can see that, but in this case the pneumothorax may not be always very pronounced, you can again, it can be subtle also, you can see the length margin here, the absence of parenchymal margin here, but there is not much of a mediastinal shift because there is a small pneumothorax. Now, what is this? This is also a case of pneumothorax you are but you are not seeing the lung margin you are not seeing the bronchovascular markings how do you say that this is pneumothorax what are we, what are we seeing then is it the pectoralis major yes boss it is the pectoralis major you are seeing it is the fibers of the pectoralis major that you are seeing how are, i am not see, i don't see the pectoralis major fibers normally how can i see the pectoralis major now because the air from the lung or the air from the respiratory tract has passed on fast due to its higher pressure, because there is leakage of air, because there is pneumothorax, it has passed on into the different layers so in between the layers of the pectoralis major, major and each of the fibers are visible. And this is called the surgical emphysema. When it comes into the subcutaneous space, we call it as subcutaneous emphysema. When the air dissects like a surgeon into the different layers of the, the different layers of the muscle the subcutaneous tissue we call it as the surgical emphysema when we see surgical emphysema it means there is pneumothorax or there is a tracheal injury intercostal drainage intercostal drainage intercostal drainage don't wait to see for the wait for the lung margin 
Don't wait for the CT. It is the treatment is intercostal drainage because there is pneumothorax. But how did the pectoralis major become visible? Answer is still outside. Basically, in an X-ray, we know that there is an air density, soft tissue density, and a bone density. If two densities of the same kind are in contact, we will it will the margins will not be visible. This is called sill outside. Why is it called sill outside? We will see. This is a sill out. See this female and the male. When the soft tissue density of the male is in contact with the soft tissue density of the female, we are not seeing the margin. Likewise, when the soft tissue density of the pectoralis major is in contact with the soft tissue density of another fiber of pectoralis major, we are not seeing the different fibers of the pectoralis major. But in case of a surgical emphysema, the air comes between. When the air density comes in between the two soft tissue densities, we will clearly see the margins, like, like what we see in this sillout. So, this is called a sillout sign. So, in case of a surgical emphysema, we will see the different fibers of the pectoralis major. We can also see the intercostal drainage, which is, which is the treatment of the same. Now, this is another x-ray which we commonly see in our clinical practice. What is this x-ray? This is a case of consolidation. Even though generally consolidation is treated with medicine, respiratory medicine, postoperatively in many patients, we will come across the consolidation or pneumonia. If, when we see consolidation, it is also called it is pneumonia. Generally, it is pneumonia in surgical practice. There are other reasons for consolidation, but in surgical practice, generally when we see consolidation, it is pneumonia. How will we know whether it is, whether it is a consolidation or a pneumonia? We will see this some, some amount of air in between this. When that is called air bronchogram. When the air, when we see in between the uh, between the white shadow, when we see this air shadows, we can very well make sure that it is a consolidation, it is, it is suggestive of pneumonia. So, air bronchogram is the when we see air bronchogram, there is it, it is generally pneumonia. But there are other causes also, but generally, most commonly, it will be pneumonia. What exactly is air bronchogram? Suppose here there is a bronchus. When the bronchus is coming from here, when the, in the trachea and the mediastinum, we can see clearly the air. So when the uh, bronchus has divided and comes into the lung parenchyma, it is surrounded by it is surrounded by the air 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 filled alveoli. So we no more see the margins of the bronchus because it is the air density in the bronchus and the air density in the alveoli is same. So we are no more seeing its margins, but once there is consolidation around the bronchus, we will start seeing the air shadow inside the bronchus. We will start seeing the air shadow inside the bronchus. This is called air bronchogram. Air bronchogram in an x-ray is suggestive of pneumonia. Now, these are the lobes of the lungs. Why, why do I want to show the lobes of the lung? I am showing the lobes of the lung because we can see on the right side, on the right side of the lung, the lower part of the lung is formed by the lower lobe and the middle lobe. So, when you see an opacification in the lower zone of the X-ray, it can be either a lower lobe consolidation. See, the posterior part is more formed by the lower lobe. The anterior part is formed by the middle lobe. There is a doubt that whether there is a lower lobe pneumonia or a middle lobe pneumonia. So, that means in when in the X-ray, in the lower zone, when there is a consolidation, when there is a consolidation, we have a doubt whether it is a lower lobe pneumonia or a middle lobe pneumonia. I will show you X-ray. You see, one of these is a middle lobe pneumonia, one of these is a lower lobe pneumonia. How will you identify? Both are X-rays showing consolidation on the lower lower part of the x-ray, on the lower zone of the x-ray, one is a middle lobe pneumonia, one is a lower lobe pneumonia. We will identify this. Again, T. This is the x-ray of middle lobe pneumonia. How will you identify it? You can see that the middle lobe here is in close opposition with the cardiac shadow. The cardiac shadow is a fluid, is blood filled, so it is white in color. 
the middle lobe is normally black so in case of consolidation the middle lobe turns white so the fluid density in the middle lobe is in opposition with the fluid density in the cardiac shadow the result is you will not be able to see the cardiac silhouette the silhouette sign comes to your help here when the soft tissue density or the fluid density of the middle lobe is in contact with the cardiac density of the heart the soft tissue density of the heart we will no more see the cardiac silhouette so if we are seeing a lower lobe consolidation and if we are not seeing the cardiac border we can very well say that it is a middle lobe pneumonia now this is a case of the lower lobe pneumonia we know that the middle lobe is in close opposition so there is an air density in between the cardiac shadow and the consolidation in the lower lobe so we can see the border of the heart so if the cardiac silhouette is visible in case of a lower lobe consolidation we can very well say that it is a lower lobe pneumonia that is how we identify the difference between a lower lobe pneumonia and a middle lobe pneumonia cardiac shadow seen cardiac silhouette seen lower lobe pneumonia cardiac silhouette not seen middle lobe pneumonia now this is a case of pleural effusion this is a case of left sided pleural effusion how will we differentiate between the pneumonia one thing is that we can say we can we are not seeing any air inside the white of the pleural fluid it is fully white that means it is a pleural effusion there is no air bronchogram it is not allowed or like consolidation next thing it helps us if you see the fluid in the test tube you can see the fluid is it in a curvy look it is in like a meniscus this is due to this look of this fluid at the edge it does comes up near to the glass it comes up to the glass this meniscus appearance of the fluid is due to the surface tension of the fluid exactly this meniscus sign happens in the pleural fluid pleural fluid so in case of a pleural fluid pleural effusion there is also a meniscus sign we are not going to see a meniscus sign in case of a hydropneumothorax in case of hydropneumothorax the line will uh, hydropneumothorax the line will be a straight line we are not going to go into detail about the hydropneumothorax because it is more towards a medical case we will deal with the right hemothorax this is an x ray after a gunshot injury showing a right hemothorax again we are seeing the many some amount of meniscus sign here we will only see these types of hemothorax if the patient stands erect to see the air fluid level but generally our patients will be in this position they will not be in a condition to to be made erect so most of our pay trauma patients will come like this and we will be only be we will have to contend with the supine x-ray this is an x-ray this x-ray when we see at first we will feel that there is no problem but this is a case of hemothorax this is a case of right hemothorax this is a supine view we are not seeing a definite air fluid level say this is a supine view we we know that there is water in that bucket how of course we will see the we know that there is water no of course we see the fish swimming in it so that we know so we know that there is water but apart from thanks for watching hope to see you again in next lectures and presentations do not forget to share and like the video with my best wishes dr atf ahmad and visit my website drat.net